Thank you, worship team. They've told the story. I don't know what I'm needed for. <laughs> it's all been sung and, de- and done. It's great. Thank you. Have you heard of alternative history? Amazon television has a show now, The Man in the High Castle. It's popular. Good example of alternative history. What if the Nazis won World War II? That's what happens in this show set in 1962. The United States is defeated by both Japan and Germany. America is split into the greater Nazi Reich in New York City and the Japanese Pacific states on the west coast centered in Los Angeles. And this middle America is just a neutral zone. And it gives you this strange feeling as you watch this show and you see swastikas in places that we know in New York City. And we see the Midwest reduced to ugliness and poverty. This is a good way to think about historical events because when you imagine what the world would be like without that event, it gives you a clear picture of how important the event really was. There's a whole field of study where historians take events in the past and ask the question, what would be different now in the present if this thing had not happened in the past? The discipline is called alternative history. It picks an event. It starts there. That's called the point of divergence. They hypothetically delete this event, and then they extrapolate from that point forward the consequences of erasing this moment. What's the ripple effect? How would it affect our lives today if that didn't happen? Now, alternative history is not new. A book came out years ago entitled, If It Had Happened Otherwise. Winston Churchill wrote a chapter in it. The question he dealt with was, what would it be like if Robert E. Lee had won the Battle of Gettysburg? Another chapter. What if John Wilkes Booth had missed when he shot Abraham Lincoln? And there are other interesting chapters. What if Napoleon had escaped to America? What if Nazi Germany had won World War II? I wonder where Philip K. Dick got his idea for The Man in the High Castle that became a book that became an Amazon TV show. You get the drift of alternative history. You go back in time and see what would happen, how your life would be impacted without whatever. And that's what I want to do with the resurrection this Sunday. Let's look at Easter through a lens of alternative history and ask what would be different now if Jesus had never come out of that grave? What if Jesus was not the great I am, but the great I was? The Apostle Paul helps us answer the question, 1 Corinthians 15, he is into alternative history before alternative history is cool. He imagines how life would be different if Christ had never risen from the dead. And before we get into what Paul had to say, think about our current culture. How would it be different if Jesus hadn't come out of that grave? If the resurrection of Jesus hadn't happened, you could pretty much delete our best hospitals. In fact, you could pretty much delete medical care for common people because that all started with Christians reaching out in compassion to help and to heal. You can delete our best schools. Followers of the risen Christ started Harvard, Yale, Princeton, so many other schools started to preach the Bible, to teach the Bible. Without Jesus and his resurrection, there'd be fewer orphanages, homeless shelters, feeding centers, because most of those are started in Jesus' name. When you think about it, a case could be made that had Jesus not come out of that grave, there wouldn't be a United States of America. Historians say without the influence of Jesus, this nation would look pretty much like 20th century China. But, In 1620, before the pilgrims landed on our east coast, they sat in the captain's quarter of the ship and wrote a birth certificate in the United States that we call the Mayflower Compact. And it is one of many documents that record the stated purpose of establishing this nation. It is for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. Therefore, no resurrection, no church, no 
United States of America as we know it. Well, obviously, Paul writes 1 Corinthians 15 a long time before we became a nation. But he points out that if we deleted the resurrection, what we're really deleting is hope. And he starts writing alternative history, 1 through 14. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. So without the resurrection, there is no basis for us to have the faith that we have. The message paraphrases that if Jesus had not been raised from the dead, then everything you have staked your life on is smoke and mirrors. Think about it. If Jesus is not risen from the dead, he has no power to offer salvation or eternal life or heaven. There's no hope. Author Philip Yancey tells about an unusual funeral he attended. Friends and family gathered around the casket. There wasn't any singing. There were no words spoken. At a set time, everyone slipped a peppermint in their mouth and waited it for it to dissolve. And as soon as the candy had dissolved, each person would walk away in silence. It was a metaphor of death. This is the end. That's it. Life just kind of dissolves. And if there's no resurrection, that's how it would be. We live, we die, that's it. Just melt away. If we delete the resurrection, we delete heaven too. We have no hope of heaven, no streets of gold, no eternity in a place of no more mourning or crying or sadness or pain. If Easter is deleted, we delete along with that family reunions with members of the family that we have loved and lost a while. And I know that many are longing for that day when they'll be back with somebody they deeply loved on earth. But no resurrection... You can just delete the joy of reunion. The anticipation goes right along with it. Gone. If Easter is deleted, so is healing. Our bodies are all in need of of ultimate healing. Without the resurrection, the life we experience in this body, in this world, is all we're going to get. See why I say that if you delete Easter, you actually delete hope? Paul goes on, verse 17, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. That means if we delete the resurrection, we also delete God's forgiveness and grace. We're still guilty of every sin we ever committed. We are dead in our sins. We're living under that weight. Back in 2000, Cornelius Anderson was arrested and convicted of a burglary. After his conviction, the judge told him, wait for further instructions and report to prison. But the instructions never came. He waited and waited after his conviction, and the days turned into months, and the months turned into years, and he got married, and he had three children, and he became a carpenter, and he raised his children, and he turned his life around, and he had a thriving business, and he paid his taxes, he got his driver's licenses renewed on time, he was a model citizen, and then in July of 2013, the Missouri State Department of Corrections realized their oversight and came knocking at his door. Sent out a fully armed fully automatic SWAT team to arrest Cornelius Anderson. His attorney, interviewed by reporters, said, I told them, one of these days, they're going to come knocking, and you better be ready. You know, that's pretty much what our life would be like without Easter. We want to do more good than bad. We want to get our lives on track. We hope that in the end, the good outweighs the bad. But in the back of our mind, we know we're guilty and we're just waiting for that knock on the door. And then we will pay for what we have done. But because of Easter, we're free from that. 
We live under the grace of God. We don't live under guilt. We are free from condemnation. Some wonder, if the cross is where Jesus paid for our sins, why is this resurrection even necessary? Did Jesus need to come back to life for our sins to be forgiven? I mean, the cross was the payment for our sins, but the resurrection completed the transaction. If Jesus had died and stayed dead, he wouldn't have the power of life. Therefore, he doesn't have the power to save us. Our sins are still unforgiven. We're still dead in our sins. Think of it like Costco or Sam's Club. You ever lose your receipt before you get to the door? I can tell you, you do not want to do that. If you lose your receipt, they are not letting you out of that store with anything. You can talk to your blue in the face to the person minding the door, and they, you might as well be talking to a wall. They will not hear a word. They will remind you, you know when you signed up to belong to Sam's Club, to Costco, you, you admitted that nothing actually belongs to you until you show the receipt at the door, and then it's yours. So if you lose your receipt, you are in for a lot of fun. They're going to march you back to the cash register. They're going to look through all the records. They're going to try to figure out if you really paid for this thing or not. They verify the purchase at the door. Think about Easter as the receipt. Jesus paid for our sins on the cross. He purchased our freedom, our forgiveness on the cross. But the resurrection is what validates it. The resurrection is the proof of purchase. It's the receipt. It gives us great confidence. No matter what we have done, we have the grace of God. If you delete the resurrection, you delete that freedom. And you are still in bondage to your sins and past mistakes. You delete the resurrection... You delete redemption. That's a beautiful thing. When God picks up all the broken pieces of your life and puts them together in such a way, they're beautiful. You delete the resurrection, you delete forgiveness. And there's this big bill you still owe. There's a judgment against you and you're going to be punished. Ultimately, if we delete the resurrection, we delete grace. Paul reminds us what a difference this one event in history made. It gives us purpose in life. Here, Paul, here's his train of thought, chapter 15. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, there is no resurrection from the dead. If there is no resurrection of the dead, we won't be raised from the dead. If we aren't raised from the dead, it makes no difference how we live. Verse 32. If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Fair conclusion. If this is all there is, if there isn't any right or wrong, good or bad, hey, why not satisfy all your appetites? Suddenly, the you only go around once in life slogan makes a whole lot of sense. But really, nothing makes sense because you don't know where you're going. You don't have any direction. Doesn't matter which way you go, doesn't matter how you get there. Suppose you're at an airport headed for an important meeting in Boston, and the announcement comes over the speaker system. Your flight's just been canceled. You go to the desk and you tell the lady, it's important for me to be in Boston at a certain time for this meeting. And if, that, if I can't get to Boston, I might as well get my, cancel my ticket. I might as well stay here if I can't get there for that meeting. And she says, let me see what I can do. And she walks over to her computer and she works for a few minutes and she comes back with this big smile on her face and you think you're about to hear good news. There's an alternative flight to Boston, so hope rises. And she says in a very helpful voice, well, I couldn't get you to Boston, but I can get you to Baltimore. 
And here's what you want to say. You don't, you don't open your mouth, but you want to say. And I get on a map that they're about that far apart. But you know, lady, in the real world, they are hours apart. How am I going to get from Baltimore to Boston in time for my meeting? Now, I know they both start with B, but so does Bangkok. You're going to put me in Bangkok? <laughs> now, you don't say any of that, but um, you stand there looking a little shell-shocked, and then she repeats, I can't get you to Boston, but I can get you to Baltimore. Will that work for you? And now a whole other stream of thoughts come popping into your mind that you don't dare let pop out of your mouth. You say, well, that's like saying to my wife, I know you asked me to get a vacuum cleaner, but I got a lawnmower instead. Will that work for you? <laughs> I know I, you asked me, honey, to, to tape the big game, but I tape Dancing with the Stars instead. Will that work for you? And finally you do say, well, I appreciate your spirit. I know you're trying to be helpful, but really, I need to be in Boston. That's my destination. That's where the meeting is. You see, a destination gives us purpose. And that's what Easter does for us. The resurrection says there's a destination, and if you put your trust in Jesus, that destination is heaven. And since we have a destination, our lives have direction. They have purpose. But you take away the destination... Who cares where you go? Who cares what direction? Who cares where you end up? Does it matter how you travel, if you travel at all? If you don't have any place to be? Easter gives us an ultimate destination. You delete Easter, you delete meaning. Because... Otherwise, this life is all there is. Nothing lasts. You delete Easter. You delete satisfaction. Everything is temporary. Everything is disappointing. You have experienced this. I know you have. You told yourself, if I get that job and I make that kind of money, then I'll have it made. And you got that job, and you made more money than you ever thought you would make, and you wonder, is this all there is? Motivation is deleted if you delete Easter. What are we doing this for? Verse 19, if only for this life we have hope in Christ. In other words, if there is no resurrection from the dead and the only good Jesus does for us is in this life, Paul concludes, we are to be pitied more than all people. Think about that. Do you know Christians who don't feel that way? I hear Christians say, if, I, if it turns out that Jesus is not the Son of God, that he never rose from the grave, there's no such thing of heaven, I still wouldn't have any regrets about living this Christian life. What? Anyone who talks that way isn't really living a Christian life described in Scripture. Because what Paul describes as the Christian life is a life of sacrifice and service. It's a life that revolves around Jesus. It's built on the foundation of Jesus. And if Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, all your sacrifice, all your generosity, all the struggle that you've gone through to live a holy life, even your presence here today, all those things we do is just a waste of time. The money, the effort, what are you doing it for? You could have indulged your appetite. You could have been driving fancy cars and fulfilling your every physical fantasy. You see, if we're serious about following Jesus, we should be living in a way that people would say, if Jesus hasn't risen from the dead, I pity you. Anybody say that about you? Verse 20, Paul pivots, does a complete about face. He steps away from all this alternative history stuff to reality. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. You go back to the beginning of the chapter, it's as if Paul says, we're going to play this game here called alternative history, and we're going to imagine what it would be like if Jesus hadn't risen from the dead. If he was the great I was, but Jesus did arise from the dead. Verse 5, 
mentions some of the people who saw him in the resurrected body. He says one time, 500 people, more people than we have right here, saw Jesus at the same time. That's pretty hard to drink. He points out that many of those people at the time he was writing are still living. You don't believe Jesus arose from the dead? Go talk to one of those 500. They'll tell you. And then he gives all kinds of reliable evidence, verifiable evidence, that Jesus came back out of that grave. And if you're skeptical of all this stuff, I suggest a book called The Case for Easter by Lee Strobel. Paul says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. And since that actually happened, it has ramifications for us today. All the things that we deleted in our little I was, no resurrection, alternative history, exercise, they're back. It means we have hope, forgiveness, grace, purpose in life, motivation. Since Jesus is the great I am, we get back all the things that are deleted as Jesus was the great I was. Look how Paul wraps up the chapter, verse 58. Therefore, because Christ is risen from the dead, therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves full to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That is purpose. Everything you ever do for the Lord has purpose, both in time and in eternity. Because Jesus arose from the dead, you live with purpose. That means that how we live, who we love, what we do matters more than we can possibly imagine. And not only do we have purpose because Jesus came out of that grave, we have grace. He frees us from our sins. 57. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus has risen from the dead, we have hope. Love the way Paul describes it, verses 54 and 5. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Because of the resurrection, we have hope. Even death can't take away. Two boys were hit by a train and killed instantly. The boys were close friends. Families were friends. They decided they were going to have a double funeral for them. They were laid out in the sanctuary of the church. They both attended. One boy was in front of the pews on one side of the church. The other boy was in front of the pews on the other. And the friends and the family of each boy sat on the respective side. And everyone there that day noticed the dramatic difference between the sides. On one side of the sanctuary were seated family and friends who loved Jesus. They had the hope of heaven. They mourned. They grieved. But they comforted each other. Because they knew the great I am. On the other side were people who did not know Jesus. They did not have the hope of heaven. They wept. They wailed. They could not be consoled because they knew the great I was. Boys were the same age. Died at exactly the same time in the same way. What was the difference? One side grieves but has hope. The other side grieves with no hope. What's the difference? The resurrection of the grave. I am. You see, this event that happened so long ago makes all the difference now. It gives us hope. Message paraphrases 55, death is swallowed up by triumphant life. Who gets the last word, O oh death? O oh death, who's afraid of you now? Paul's trash talking death. That's what's going on here. Paul is mocking death. Why? It's been defeated. There's victory. 
Paul reminds us in the strongest terms, we have hope. And it's because of the resurrection. There are two kinds of people here today. Some of you know the power of the resurrection. You've experienced this power in your life. You know the difference Jesus makes. You know the great I am. Others here this Easter Sunday are living like Easter never happened. Like Jesus was the I was. No purpose. I'm not saying you don't work hard. I'm not saying you don't accomplish things. I'm just saying that at the end of the day, what you're working for won't last. It won't matter. And deep down, you know it. Some are living under a burden of guilt and shame because of sin in your life. Have all these broken pieces that you can't seem to put back together and it doesn't seem like there's anything you can do about it. You're living without God's grace. You're living without hope. You have a sense of disappointment and disillusionment in life because deep down you know you are putting your hope in something. It's just a thing. And it's going to disappoint you. The I was lifestyle. But Easter's I am. And many years ago, Jesus came out of that grave and now offers us hope and grace and purpose. And what a beautiful thing Easter is. It seals these things for us. Now they can't be taken away. Guy at the door at Costco can't take your stuff away once you show him the receipt. Nobody can take away your grace once Jesus came out of that grave. We have purpose. And it can't be deleted no matter what stage of life we're in, no matter what situation we're in. You have purpose, you have direction, whether you're in a wheelchair, or a top executive chair, or an easy chair. You have purpose. And it can't be deleted. You may be an elementary student, you may be a nursing home resident, but nothing you do for Jesus is useless. It has purpose. You have grace in your life because of what Jesus did on the cross and what he did when he came out of that grave. Our sin does not delete God's grace. Our greed, lust, selfishness, materialism, anger, lies, none of that nor all of that put together can delete the grace of God in your life. It's been sealed by the resurrection. Hope cannot be deleted. The addiction cannot delete hope. The diagnosis of the disease cannot delete hope because you got Jesus. Abuse cannot delete grace. It's been sealed. Death cannot even delete hope. It's been secured by the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. And nothing in this world, no circumstances, no pain, no suffering can take away the hope that we have through Jesus, the great I am. And that's why we celebrate today. We're not here to remember some event that happened a long time ago that has nothing to do with today. It's not a tradition. It's not a ritual. We are here today because what happened that day changes everything this day. And it gives us the same power that brought Jesus back from the dead right into our lives. And that power fuels our purpose, our hope, and the grace that's available to each of us. Praise God for the great I am. Father, thank you for loving us so much that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. Today we're celebrating how he came back to life, how he conquered the grave, and then shared that resurrection with everybody who believes in him. We are overwhelmed by the power of the resurrection available to us today. May this not be a day when we just remember something that happened years ago. Rather, let this be a day when we experience resurrection power right here, right now.
And we ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. It's communion time. Happy Resurrection Day. This is the body of Christ. Happy Resurrection Day. This is the blood of Christ. Why do we bring a dark, bloody memory of Christ's crucifixion into a bright springtime celebration of his resurrection? Why do we have the Lord's Supper on Easter Sunday? Why have an eulogy in the midst of a rebirth day party? Because when our risen Lord raised his resurrection hands, the scars of the spikes were still visible. Because when he invited his friends and his followers to confirm in their own minds the reality of the resurrection, he did not say, touch my hair, my nose, my fingers the calluses from years of work in the carpenter shop. John 20, 26 through 28. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus didn't point to the familiar marks of his life, but to the cruel, horrible marks of his death. So we have to allow the dark, bloody memory of his crucifixion to intrude into our celebration of his resurrection. So happy resurrection day. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Happy resurrection day. This is the blood of the covenant poured out for you. Father, help us see the light of our Lord's resurrection more sharply as we stand in the shadow of his death partaking of the Lord's Supper this Resurrection Sunday. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.